how much it can contribute to drought. Well, how well does people who push know it's CO2? How do we know it's CO2? Well, you look at their models. This graph came from the 2014 National Climate Assessment. And it's showing, what they're showing you is, circle in red, they focus on the future. By 2100, they're saying that almost half of North America is going to be in drought due to rising CO2. But when I look at that graph, I don't get scared. The right side is pure, untested speculation. If you look at the red spikes on the left, those are actual observations. If I compare how well the model simulates the past and compare model results to the actual observed data, the CO2-driven models fail. In contrast, observations show that during the Dust Bowl years, nearly 40% of North America was in drought. How well did the models predict that? Well, if you see, follow that blue line at the very bottom, that was what the model predictions were. The models don't incorporate landscape change. They do a very poor job of that. If you look at the next highest peak, it's the 1950s, widespread droughts for the Southwest. Of people I know that were ranchers in Texas, they think that was one of the worst times for them. If you look down at the bottom, that's how well the models did it. So the question is, you know, how much, you know, is all this, how much would you trust a doctor who misdiagnosed 97% of his patients? Even if they were part of the consensus. To me, it makes no sense. And, and I feel like part of this crisis is, is what I really call it. It's not real, but it's, I call it model noia. It's untestable. It's future speculation. It, 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 it's a reasonable hypothesis to think CO2 does it. The models are wrong. They're not working. It, it, and, and that's where I thought we should have a synergy. People who look at it from natural variability, look at landscape change, you combine it with the, the, how you understand CO2 and come up with better models. But instead, you know, you get deny the deniers the right to deny. Heat waves naturally follow drought. And if, if you don't believe that heat waves can happen naturally, you just have to look at Death Valley. The most extreme temperature, the highest temperature ever recorded, happened in Death Valley. It happened in 1913. It had nothing to do with solar energy. It had nothing to do with carbon dioxide energy. That, it, it had to do with the natural climate change that was amplified in an area that was very dry without any vegetation. But, but a lot of people say, well, we're going to have more heat waves because CO2 is causing heat to accumulate in the environment. And so you're naturally going to have heat waves, but, but climate is on steroids. We're going to have more and more heat waves. But if you look at the data in the United States, you don't see that. Some, this is broken up to regions. This was published in 2013 by uh, about 15 of our top scientists from NOAA and elsewhere. You don't see every place suffering that same kind of heat wave. And if you look at the average for the United States, there in the left-hand corner, you see, again, the 30s, the 40s, when we screwed up the landscape, dominated the heat waves. And you see also there's a little bit of this uh, cyclic nature to these heat waves, higher in the 30s and lower. If you look at all the data, all the temperature data for the contiguous United States, data that's not homogenized but is quality controlled for instrument change, location change, you get that same cycle. Higher in the 30s, it dipped, and then it rose. And it rose since the 50s. And this is, if you look at most of the studies, when they say uh, CO2 correlates well with, with rising temperatures, the rising CO2 only correlates well since the 50s. It doesn't explain these natural cycles. It, it has no correlation with the 30s, and that's why their models are so wrong. But there is something people are starting to understand. And again, it wasn't found out by atmospheric scientists, it was found out by fishery biologists, called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. These fishery biologists noticed that the fish, the fish moved northward during a positive, I'm going to call it the PDO, because Pacific Decadal Oscillation just doesn't roll off the tongue. And then when it went to a negative phase, the fish moved backwards. Scientists just this month published a paper where for the whole century, if you look at climate change in California, the, the CO2 CO2-driven models said they couldn't figure out. They say that the Pacific Decadal Oscillation explains all the changes in climate for the last century. Now, why does it do that? Well, when it's in its positive phase, you get more El Ninos. And El Ninos ventilate more heat. And so you see temperatures rise when that happens. Between 1946 and 1976, it went into a negative phase. And you get more La Ninas. And it absorbs more heat. It doesn't ventilate it. And temperatures seem to drop. 
when we had this big rise in temperature between the 70s and the 90s, we had loss of El Ninos, loss of ventilation of heat. And so you see this cycle. This PDO is getting more attention right now because for the last 20 years, there's been no global warming. Because since 1999, the last big El Nino, we've been in this negative phase, and we're not ventilating any heat. So people are starting to think natural cycles have to be considered much, much better. To, to give you a pictorial uh, example of what this is, of, it's, it's a seesaw between warmer, uh, yet warmer than normal seas, uh, oceans when it's positive, it's like in El Nino. We have warmer waters all along the west coast of, uh, of the Americas. And then when it cycles into what we call now a cool La Nina phase, it, it's more La Nina-like. So is this the seesaw effect. And what the seesaw effect does is it moves the moisture back and forth. So I've heard people say, oh, geez, we got droughts in California, and we got floods in Pakistan, the world's going crazy, and it's all due to CO2. But if you understand a Pacific Decadal Oscillation, if you understand El Ninos and La Ninas, it explains it perfectly. You expect this kind of seesaw. The trade winds, when they're strong, they, they sweep all the solar heated water into this gigantic warm pool around, centered around Australia and Indonesia. When that heat builds up there, it causes more convection, it causes more precipitation. That's what we're going through right now. And when that happens, you get more floods and more rains around Southeast Asia. You've heard floods in Thailand, floods in Pakistan. That's because it's pushed all the moisture over there. While it's pushing all the moisture there, what, what this does is it robs Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, and we get droughts in America. And it's been going on that way for, for years. And, and the tree ring data and a ton of data shows you that's going on. Also, when you have this La Nina, down here at the bottom, a lot of this heat is stored at depth. And then it gets released when you go into the opposite phase. You also get this upwelling, which I'm going to talk about a little about whales and ocean acidification, because that's one of the key. But this upwelling brings cooler temperatures. So all along the, the west coast of the Americas, it's cooler. And what that does, it, it increases the, the persistence of these high pressure systems. And these high pressure systems block the rain bearing westerly winds that carry moisture from the ocean to the continents. The high pressure system normally persists during the summer blocking storms and creating California's warm and dry summers. The high pressure typically breaks down each year as we advance towards winter, but the cooling of the oceans due to stronger La Niña's and a negative PDO can cause the blocking high to also persist during the winter. That causes low snowfall and drought in California as it pushes storms and rains northward. People I know in Washington had record-breaking rains at the same time we were getting record-breaking droughts. And it's all kind of driven by these ocean surface temperatures. Here's one good thing about models. Models are not all bad. When they take a model, they freeze it in time, and they match this pattern of the Pacific Cadal Oscillation with the La Nina. It, they can get the circulation patterns and how it delivers the water almost exactly. The one they have the most difficulty with is the Dust Bowl, and that's because landscape changes are also the issue. But when you force it with that kind of temperature, it, it performs well. But when you start it off on its own and say, here's what I think is natural, I'm going to add CO2, what happens? It fails miserably. So, so the models give us an idea, but not when they're driven by CO2 on their own. We were at a family reunion down in the, at uh, Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and it was the coolest summer they'd ever had. And partly this same show where we're getting real hot in, in California, the jet stream comes up, and then it brings cold air down this way. So some of this seesaw action, whether it's, it's rain and drought in Asia, or rain and drought in, in North America, warm and cold, it's not climate gone crazy. It's exactly what you'd expect from these natural cycles. We get relief when an El Nino, the hot water uh, flows across, and what you do, that temperature gradient that kept strong trade winds is, is now relaxed. And so what you see is the, the trade winds relax more, and that water that was being stored around Indonesia starts to flood over. That weakens the high-pressure system that's blocking the rains, and then we start to get our rains. To give you one sense of the power of an El Nino in this ventilating heat, this is uh, satellite data for the global temperature 
67. If you look, that big, that was the last big El Nino, 97, 98. When it ventilated the heat, global average temperature jumped by over a degree. That's more than what it did in a century. And then when it stopped ventilating, temperatures dropped back down again. That still begs the question, is this heat that's being stored, is that from the sun or is that from CO2? James Hansen thinks it's from CO2. And he predicted in 2006 we'd have a super El Nino that far exceeded 97 and 98. And if you see where 2006 is on the screen, no such thing happened. Argo data also shows us that the upper 300 meters of the ocean has slightly cooled or not warmed at all since 2003. So for me, that suggests it's, solar is really driving it, and the oceans are kind of modulating it by absorbing it and releasing it. Uh, and I just, when I put this quote up of, uh, of one of the IPC people, because we're in this uh, La Nina stage, and there's no ventilation heat and there's no rise, none of the models predicted this hiatus. And he said, you know, if this continues for five years, we've got to admit that we were all wrong. He said, it's, embarrass it's embarrassing. We, we only have two possibilities. Either we overestimated sensitivity of CO2 or we underestimated natural cycle. I think it's both. Still, people like to tell us that the world is on fire. And I'm particularly sensitive because our fuel station had fire come within a couple hundred meters a couple of times. They say that CO2 is drying the land and it's causing increasing fires. Well, if you put it into a historical perspective, it looks like bogus propaganda. This was a, a study looking at the number of fires, the frequency of fires throughout the Southwest. If you look between 1700 and 1900, there are a tremendous amount of fires. From 1900 to now, we hardly see anything. It, it, so we see rising CO2 during this time, but we see very little fires. I'm tempted to tell the story that, like a good fire extinguisher, CO2 is putting the fires out, but it's really more suppression of fire. Although there is no correlation with rising CO2, there's a strong connection with PDOs and La Ninas. Strong La Ninas only happen every three to seven years. The negative PDO happens 20 to 30 years and then switches to its positive phase. A, a strong La Nina and a negative Pacific decay oscillation happens at the same time. It happens 23% of the time. Since 1700, that 23% of the time caused 70% of the large fires throughout the Southwest. This study was done in the Rocky Mountain National Park. Now what I'm seeing for everything from drought and heat waves to wildfires is that our climate is far more sensitive to landscape changes and natural ocean cycles and is much less sensitive to changes in rising CO2. Any questions? I've, I've heard that specific ocean temperatures are, are higher. It depends where you go. Uh, and the, the question was, he heard that Pacific temperatures were higher. And, and if you look at the upper 700 feet, it's actually real cooler. If you have situations where there's no wind, then the surface temperature will jump up real quick. When you have a lot of wind, it, it, it alleviates that heat. So I'd, I'd have to know exactly what they were saying. But if you look at, if you look at the heat from about 700 meters, it's the east side, the, the west side of the Pacific is warmer. The east side around here is a lot cooler. You had a question? Question? Um, or two. Uh, when do, uh, what do you think the impact will be when they um, get rid of the dams in Northern California and the Klamath? And then also, what do, you, do you think that this drought was impacted when the government turned the water off in Central um, California? I don't know quite how to answer that. I know what they're trying to do is, uh, I don't know how when they turn the water off, how they spread it out and what it was doing. It, I, I think what we got to do is spend more money to say we're naturally going to have droughts. Uh, there are trees in the bottom of Lake Tahoe that are 6,000 years old that were growing when the Lake Tahoe was very, very low. So we're going to expect these kind of droughts. So, so how, do you, how do you save the water? How do you keep it on the land? And how do you do it in a way that doesn't impact you know, fisheries and other kind of wildlife? I know when they dammed up Lake Tahoe, it was one of the earliest dams in 1900, it caused Lake Winnemucca to dry up. So it, you, know, you have to look at the whole picture. Is you, you've made it uh, more wet in, on Tahoe, but you dried out part of Nevada. When they pump more water to, to, uh, excuse me, to LA, we saw uh, they dried out Owens Lake. So you, know, you had to have kind of a bigger picture with, with, with all this going on. So I, I can't quite give you 
uh, a straight answer on any of those. Just it, and you know, I, I think they're caught in saying, how do I protect wildlife? How do I protect the farmers? How do I protect uh, urban water supplies? And I, I think they're wasting too much time looking at CO2. I think they got to look at natural cycles because we see these going. You, you're going to expect every 40 years more drought. And, and if you go back in time like 1,000 years ago, we had tremendous droughts. The, the oceans looked like they were in more La Nina conditions. And that's when we had terrible droughts. And, and Anastasi, the Pueblo cultures all uh, were decimated. The Mayans were all decimated. I, you know, that could happen again. So, so it's, what my money would be, let's understand how these cycles work. Let's see how we can predict them. Yeah, look, I mean, the uh, carbon tax uh, taxes in California are going to start January. So we're going to see the effect economically, if not any other way. And I, I, I see nationally we've been pushing for the carbon tax and this kind of thing. Why do you think we're pushing to get all these taxes and things in place when most a lot of these models and a lot of the stuff that's come out doesn't support it? Well, uh, and, and that, it, it, it boggles my mind. And, and I say a lot of this stuff is political theory because they're trying to get policies to go whichever way they want. You, you know, and, and when, you, when you look at some of these political issues, you get a lot of strange bedfellows. You get some people that are really concerned and think you know, the world is truly going to climate hell. You've got other people that are uh, maybe forking over money to politicians for biofuels that really don't need it, but they're, you know, they're satisfying another constituent. You have some people, uh, there's an old saying that a belief is not something uh, that the mind possesses. A belief is something that possesses the mind. And I think a lot of people, once you lock onto an idea, you, you don't want to be wrong. And you try to make it up. So and I think it's a combination of all these things. And it's because it's become so politicized, too. It's broken down on conservatives and the liberals. You try to defend party lines. I, I try to stay out of that. You know, I, I usually don't vote very often because I don't really trust a whole lot of people in that way. Uh, you know, I say I want more debate, but I don't want it to be a presidential debate. They never talk to each other. They just say one line and they say something else, and it's all, it's, it's all little uh, sound bites. So, you know, and those kind of political questions, I don't know how to answer. Back there. I saw something called CO2 in the ocean affecting uh, deformation of the East Coast of crab fishing. Uh -huh. Crab fishermen were complaining about you know, crabs are changing. They're getting smaller and all that, and they say it's due to absorption of CO2 in the ocean. So it's a cynical. But do you see, part? but do you see this? Is this true, or is this just somebody's imagination? I'll tell you what, I, and, and actually my next few slides are going to actually deal with that a little more specifically, but it, it, I think when you talk about ocean acidification, it's a very reasonable hypothesis. If I take a glass of water and, and, you know, out of the tap and I put a pH meter in it, I'm going to watch as the carbon dioxide dissolves in, it's going to drop down from about 7 to 6.5. Okay? And if there was nothing else going on, then you could say, yes, CO2 is causing it. But it's much more complex, and I'll try to give you a sense of that in a second. Would you say that CO2 is doing some of the things that are being said, or would you, are you saying really that it's completely uh, something to ignore? What I say is, it, in, and I'm looking for a few experiments in, in the next 20 years. I, I can't say how sensitive the climate is to CO2. I think it's really hard to separate landscape changes, natural cycles, solar changes from the effects of CO2. They all do the same thing. What we do have now is sort of an experiment that Right as, as we go into a cool phase, solar energy has now dropped almost to what it was in the Little Ice Age. And so if those things all predict, if we look at, at natural cycles in the solar, predicts that we're not going to see things get much warmer in the next few years. If that's true, it tells me that CO2 is very, it has very, very low sensitivity. Still might affect something, I don't know how much to tell. If it starts to rise and continues to rise, even though the sun is down and this, these ocean oscillations are in their cool phase, um, then I have to say it's CO2. I, you know, it's, I, have to, I need an experiment right now. I don't think we have enough information. And, and the one thing, and actually I've I got about, uh, wife, cover your ears. I have about $1,000 worth of bets out. Uh, okay, you can open it. <laughs> <laughs> I think by, by 2030, we're going to see a lot of the Arctic ice uh, recover, if, if, if these cycles are right. And, and I think there's a lot of reason to believe that's true. And, and if that doesn't happen, it's going to make me think CO2 is more powerful. But if it does happen, it's going to make me think natural cycles and solar change are more powerful.